Hi guys, my name is Mike Evans. Welcome to Innovative in Education's Organic Chemistry Series. This is Lecture 11 on ring strain and an introduction to cyclohexane. So hopefully, whether you're watching this live or recorded, you'll be able to learn something from our lecture on ring strain and cyclohexane. And keep in mind that we're in the midst of Chapter 3 right now, if you're following along on the knoll, which deals with conformational um, analysis and MO analysis and some other things we've talked about related specifically to the cycloalkanes, which are cyclic arrays of hydrocarbons. So the first thing I wanted to do today was review a little bit about what we talked about last time in terms of uh, degrees of unsaturation and cyclopropane. So last time we looked at cyclopropane and, uh, and we looked at the fact that its molecular orbitals are a little bit more complicated than you might at first think. So we thought about cyclopropane in terms of the banana bond picture, right, where we looked at it as a series of sp3 hybridized atoms, noting that in order to achieve the 60 degree bond angles typical of cyclopropane, we we're going to have to introduce some pretty funky bond angles into this thing here. And we called those banana bonds in light of the fact that they look a little bit like bananas, right? However, we saw how this picture was limited by the fact that it doesn't really help us explain a lot. For instance, it doesn't help us explain the observation that cyclopropane uh, cations, so cyclopropyl cations and cyclopropyl radicals, are more stable than we would expect on the basis of this molecular orbital picture. And so we brought in the Walsh molecular orbitals, which show us how we can use p orbitals, for instance, in the analysis of cyclopropane to explain this kind of stabilization of cations and radicals by conjugation. Additionally, we talked about the idea of degrees of unsaturation. So this is a way to tell whether you're likely or not to have a ring in your molecule. So if you know the molecular formula of a compound, for instance, let's take the example of C6H8. Knowing that formula, you can determine the number of rings and double bonds in your structure. And all you have to do is use this formula here. So take 2 times the number of carbons plus 2 Oh, yes, we're forgetting that. 2 times the number of carbons plus 2 plus the number of nitrogens minus the number of halogens minus the number of hydrogens. Divide that by 2, and that'll tell you the number of rings and multiple bonds in your structure. So, for instance, here, 2 times the number of carbons plus 2 will give us 14. Minus 8 is 6. Divided by 3 gives us a total of 3 degrees of unsaturation. And so that tells us that we have either 3 rings or double bonds in our structure. We're looking at C6H8, and so with six carbons, we would have 14 hydrogens in the fully saturated open chain form. Thus, in this molecule, we must have three degrees of unsaturation, as they're called. So today we're going to look at cyclopropane in a little more detail, and in in our, our more detailed look at cyclopropane, what we're, we're going to think about today is this idea of ring strain. So clearly, the bonds in cyclopropane are not ideally aligned for, um, for optimal orbital overlap. We saw that in the banana bond picture, and that's just as true whether we're using Walsh's orbitals or banana bonds. The fact that those bonds have to exist at 60 degree angles to one another introduces a great deal of what's called strain. Strain is a term that comes back again and again in organic chemistry. It's simply destabilization due to some structural constraint in a molecule. So for instance, in cyclopropane, we see over propane the constraint that the molecules have to exist, that the bond angles must exist at 60 degrees to one another. And in doing that, in tying two of the ends of propane together, as you can see we've done in moving from propane to cyclopropane, that introduces a substantial amount of destabilization into the molecule. So you can see a number here, 27.6 kilocalories per mole. And that may not mean a lot to you now, but a kilocalorie per mole represents a substantial amount of energy, actually. So the energy scale is logarithmic. So one kilocalorie per mole difference corresponds roughly to a difference of 10 to 1 in terms of molecules. So in terms of product ratios and things like that, 27.6 kilocalories per mole is pretty substantial. And we can see where that comes from in light of the 60 degree angle restraint 
of cyclopropane. We can divide ring strain up into a couple of different components. So in cyclopropane, the primary kind of strain is called angle strain. It's called that because the bond angles in cyclopropane are non-ideal, right? So the, the bond angles deviate from the ideal 109.5 that we see in the bottom case here, and they deviate to 60 degrees, and that substantial deviation introduces destabilization. There are other kinds of strain, however, and the way chemists know this is that we can look at a molecule that shouldn't have any angle strain at all, and when we see that it's still destabilized relative to its open chain form, we know that it, in fact, uh, includes some element of strain within it. So, for instance, take the molecule cyclopentane, which we'll actually look at in a second. If you look at cyclopentane from a purely geometrical standpoint, cyclopentane is a pentagon. It's an equilateral pentagon, and based on that analysis, we would expect it to have bond angles of 108 degrees. Noting that that is extremely close to the tetrahedral ideal of 109.5 degrees, what we can see here is that cyclopropane, or excuse me, cyclopentane, is likely to have almost no angle strain, and that turns out to be true. However, we still observe that cyclopropane is less stable than its open chain form. Uh, cyclopentane, excuse me, is less stable than its open chain form, pentane. And you'll be able to see that on the next slide here. So this example is the example of cyclobutane, which we would expect to have a substantial amount of angle strain, but it also includes this problem with cyclopentane as well of what's called eclipsing strain. So let's jump back to cyclopentane, which we'll see in a second. But cyclopentane in three dimensions looks something like this. And what you can note is that the bond angles are nearly ideal in cyclopentane. But we have this what's called eclipsing strain from the fact that the two hydrogens over here are very close to one another in space, as it turns out. They're eclipsing one another. One hydrogen is blocking the other. And as a result, they kind of bump into each other. And this introduces strain that's not present in the free uh, linear molecule. So looking on this slide at cyclobutane, what we can see is that in the open chain form, where we don't have this problem of eclipsing, these hydrogen atoms are free to get out of the way of one another. We, of course, have the most stable situation. But if we tie the ends together, then we force the hydrogen atoms to eclipse. So drawing this in three dimensions, we see those hydrogen atoms can eclipse one another. And even though it doesn't look like they introduce much strain in this drawing here, it looks like they're pointing away from one another. In fact, because the van der Waals radii of the hydrogens are fairly large, they do actually destabilize each other somewhat and destabilize the entire molecule overall. So now let's take a more detailed look at cyclopentane to see where eclipsing strain comes through in that molecule. 